Matthew chapter 19, don't forget Wednesday night service at 7. Hope you'll be here for that. Look at verse number 30. Matthew chapter 19, verse 30. The Word of God says this, But many that are first shall be last, and the last shall be first. Now jump over to chapter 20, look at verse 16. So the last shall be first, and the first last, for many be called, but few are chosen. I'll tell you about that in a moment. Let's pray. Father, bless your word. Pray you'd speak to our hearts tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. You know, as you read through the Word of God, one of the many things that you're going to find is that the Bible has a way of cha changing the way that you think. You know, for instance, you know, we're taught many things during the course of our lives as we live our lives here upon this earth. But then as we go to the Bible and go through the Bible, we find that God has something totally opposite to say about it. In fact, here's what we're told in the Bible about God's thoughts and our thoughts. In the book of Isaiah, chapter number 55, uh, the Bible says, uh, the Bible says, but for my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. Then the very next verse says this, for as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. You know, God thinks differently than you and I think. We are programmed, we are taught to think one way, but God has oftentimes in his Bible, God has a way of changing the way that we think. In fact, the Word of God says that as, as, far, as, the, as far as the heavens are above the earth, so are God's thoughts higher and holier than our thoughts. So as we move through the Bible, we, we, we encounter many, what we could call many divine paradoxes that change the way that we think as we, as, uh, we live our lives here upon this earth. Now, so we're all on the same page. Let me tell you what a paradox is, all right? A paradox is, uh, a paradox is an, an absurd or contradictory statement that when investigated, it is found to be, it is found and proven to be true. In other words, you know, we're taught one way down here on this earth, but then we're taught another way told in the Bible. And we think, man, that's got to be wrong. There's just something about that just didn't seem right. And yet when it's, when, it's, when it's found, it is proven to be true. It is a divine paradox. Now here's a paradox. This is not divine, but here's a paradox. This is one of my wife's favorite sayings. She loves to say this statement right here, less is more. Now that's a paradox because the way that we think, more is more. You know, that's why people many times work their fingers to the bone because they want more. But let me tell you something. With more always comes more. Can I have an amen? With more always comes more. You know, when you have more, there's more responsibility. There's more care that's involved. There's more uh, to fret over uh, when, you, when you think about having more. In fact, here's what Ecclesiastes chapter 5, verse 12 says about this. It says, the sleep of a laboring man is sweet. So a guy that works hard, don't have a whole lot, when he lays down, goes to bed, boy, that's sweet sleep. Whether he eat little or much, but watch this now, the abundance of the rich will not suffer him to sleep. He's worried about it. You know, he's got houses here and houses there and things here and things there. And Boy, he's worried about all that, and it drives the sleep from him because when you have more, it causes more anxiety. And sometimes it brings more stress in our life. So I guess in some kind of a way, less is more. That is a paradox. Well, as we move through the Word of God, we find many divine paradoxes in the Word of God. They seem to us to be almost absurd statements, and yet uh, they're statements that contradict human reasoning, and yet when we factor God into that statement and God into that equation, those statements and those, uh, those sayings are found to be true, and they're proven to be true. I want to give you a few examples br briefly about divine paradoxes. Listen to this. Here's what I'm talking about. Here's a divine paradox. A divine paradox is this. We're exalted as we humble ourselves. Now, in this world, what are we taught? Man, exert yourself. 
Put yourself out there. Lift yourself up. Many of you and us, when we fill out those resumes or have in times past, boy, we put down the great qualities that we possess. We put down that we're a driven person, that, uh, uh, that we're goal-oriented, and, and man, we, we want to do our very best, and we're very well-trained in this job, and we've done this, and we've done that. But God says totally opposite. God said, you want me to exalt you. What you've got to do is you've got to humble yourself. Now, I know that's contradictory to what the world says. We hear a lot today about self-esteem and, man, lift yourself up and you are somebody and we are somebody. I'll tell you why we're somebody. Because God made us and God created us and God put his love upon us. But that's the only reason we are somebody. And if we're going to be exalted by God, we've got to humble ourselves. Look at this verse right here, James chapter 4, verse 10. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord and what will he do? He will lift you up. You know, when we try to exalt ourselves, ladies and gentlemen, we're heading for a fall. The Bible said pride go up before the fall. Can I tell you what? The Bible says, tells us that Satan exalted himself. He said, I'm going to exalt my stars above the stars of God. I'm going to exalt my throne above the thrones of God, the throne of God. He said, I'm going to be like the Most High. And yet, what do we read about in the Bible? We read how God put him down. He lifted himself up and God demoted him and God, God brought him down. And yet we read over in Philippians chapter number two about the Lord Jesus, the very Son of God, who came into this world and made himself of no reputation and took upon himself the form of a servant and was humbled even to the death of the cross. But a little bit later, just another verse or so, it says, Wherefore God hath highly exalted him and given him a name that's above every name. And one day at the name of Jesus, every knee is going to bow. Every Every tongue's going to confess that he's the Lord to the glory of God the Father. What happened? Jesus humbled himself. And what did God do? God exalted him. We find that we are exalted as we humble ourselves. What a paradox that is. Here's another one. Look at this. Strength through weakness. Now, we think, man, be strong. Uh, this, this afternoon, you can't tell it. My muscles look like bee stings. But I've been lifting weights lately. And I try not to bust out of my coat, and my shirts are shrinking, and shut up. I don't even care what you think about it. I'm kidding. But I have been. I've been, I've been my wife, my wife's been, she's been working out. Well, and man, I'm telling you, I can't afford to get beat up by my wife. So I got to start lifting weights, and so I've been lifting weights, and I'm killing my shoulder, my arms hurt. But we say, our man, to be strong. I want to be strong. I want to have muscles like some of you guys got. Some of you guys, your muscles, your arms are bigger than my legs are. Man, I can't, I, I, I got to keep up with all this stuff. So we think, man, strong, be strong, you know, uh, work yourself, be strong. And yet the Word of God teaches us that we're strongest when we're weakest. Paul, over in 2 Corinthians chapter number 12, talking about that thorn that was given to him that buffeted him in the flesh, a messenger of Satan that buffeted him. He just had that great revelation at the opening of 2 Corinthians chapter 12, and he said, lest I should be exalted above measure, God allowed a messenger of Satan to buffet him, and he, and he had some difficult times, and then he went on to say, I besought the Lord three times to remove this thorn from my flesh, but God said, hey, I'll tell you what, I'm not going to remove that, but I'm going to give you grace to bear it, because in the time of your weakness, my strength is made perfect. Hey, when I realize I can't, but he can. Hey, when I realize if it rests on my shoulders, it's going to fall. But when it rests with him, it's going to succeed every time. I'm telling you, friend, when we understand how weak we are and we cast ourselves upon the mercy and the grace of God, we find out how strong we are. Weakness through strength. Uh, exalting through humility. Watch this one. Receiving through giving. Uh-oh. Yeah, we're taught in the Word of God that as we give, we receive. That's unbelievable, isn't it? Jesus himself said uh, in the, the book of Acts, one of these, it's just an, a kind of an out-of-the-way statement. You know, we think about Jesus speaking and the things that he said. We think about Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Then we go all the way over to Acts chapter number 20, and we find some more of them words with red letters on them. And here's what Jesus said. It is more blessed to give than it is to receive. 
I mean, buddy, as you and I give, that's how we receive back. When we give, we... Now, what's the world say? Man, can all you get, get all you can, put it away, save it up, don't give anybody nothing, don't bring anything to the Lord's house, don't tithe, don't give, be careful, watch out, protect your money. And yet, we're told in the Word of God, boom, give, and it shall be given into you. Good measure. Press down, shaken together, running over, shall men give into your bosom. For with what measure you, that you meet, uh, with all it shall be measured. You know what I'm just talking about? I'm talking about the Bible said, hey, you want to get something? Give something away. Hey, you want to receive, then start giving. I'm telling you, if you were to take all my bills and lay them down and then take maybe some of the money I got coming in, you think, man, how in the world can a preacher do that? But I'll tell you what, bless your heart, when you factor God into the equation, buddy, I'm talking about a God that can take five loaves and a few fishes and feed 5,000 men, not counting the women and the children. I want that kind of God writing my checks out. So you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to bring my tithe over here. And while I'm on the subject, guess what? Today's Stewardship Sunday. And I'm still planning on seeing that new building get be, uh, built. So I brought my stewardship off from me to church this morning. I'm going to give it. I, I really do give it to office. I'm going to give it to office in the morning, my stewardship. And I tell you, when I do that, I factor God into my financial equation. And bless your heart, I'll tell you what, God can do a whole lot with my little. God can take care and meet our needs. As we give, we receive. You say, explainify that when I can't. I just know it works. That's a divine paradox. Look at this one. Freedom through servitude. Are you kidding me? Most people have the idea, man, I want to be free to do what I want to do. So I want to be free. If I want to do drugs, I want to be free to do drugs. If I want to drink, I want to, if I want to shack up and run around on my spouse and, and uh, I want to do all this stuff, I can do it. I want my freedom. They don't even understand that while they're trying to be free, they're actually enslaving themselves in the bonds of sin. But bless your heart, when a child of God gives his life, I'm not just talking about his heart to Jesus, but when he gives his life to Jesus and he starts serving God, it is then and then only that we find true freedom because whom the Son sets free, he's free indeed. I'm here to tell you tonight, friend, you want to enjoy freedom. I'm glad to be in America. I'm glad I can come to church with my Bible and bring my family and come back on Wednesday night. But I got a greater freedom than that. And as I place myself in the yoke with my master, I find freedom that this world knows absolutely nothing about. I find freedom as I serve the Lord. Freedom through servitude. What about this one? Boom, gaining through losing. You say, preacher, what's that got? Well, you know, the Bible said, we, as we die, we live. I mean, uh, the Bible tells us in Philippians chapter number 3, verse number 7, for what things were gained to me, Paul said, I counted them loss. All that education, all that religion, all those degrees, all of that climbing the ladder in the Judaism and, and the learned letters and the doctors. He said, man, I counted all that was lost. Because he goes on to say this. Yea, doubtless I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord for whom I have suffered the loss of all things. But he said, I count them but as dung that I may win Christ. Paul said, I've lost so much but in losing so much I have gained so much. Man, you factor that. Go to the bank tomorrow and tell them, I want to lose a bunch of money. And by doing so, they're going to look at you like you're crazy. But as we give ourselves away, as we yield ourselves to Christ, as we die daily, amen. That's not talking about your hair neither. As we die daily, as we yield ourselves to instruments of righteousness, as we give ourselves to the Lord day by day, we actually, we lose. Yeah, we lose. But boy, do we gain so much more than we ever lose. One more, watch this one. Dying through living. I'm dying to live. 
Romans chapter 8 verse 13 says this, If you live after the flesh, you shall die. But if you through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, guess what? You're going to live. Hey, I'll tell you, friend, if I follow my flesh, I'm going to die. If I, if I yield myself to the sinful nature, I'm going to die. But as I give myself to the Lord and seek the filling of the Holy Spirit every day of my life, I get to live and enjoy life to its fullest as, my yield, as I yield myself to the Lord, give myself to Him, rely upon the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit in my life, I get to live while I die. Amen. Amen and amen. Those are divine paradoxes. But now here's the one I want to preach on tonight, and I got eight minutes. I want to preach on that one. When second is better than first. Now you say, preacher, I know, we knew, we knew, preacher, you was having mental problems. Because second ain't never better than first. But if I read the Bible correctly and understand the Word of God correctly, there are some things that are second that are better than first. While our text tonight in Matthew chapter number 19 and verse number 30, if I read this correctly, it said that many that are first are going to be last. Let me use my, if you don't mind, put my spin on that. Many that are first are going to be second. And many that are second are going to be first. Jump over across the page, verse 16, so the last shall be first and the first last. So the last, uh, the last are going to be, the second are going to be first and the first are going to be second. When second is better than first. Now I get it again. That cuts against the grain of what we've been taught in this world. We're taught in the world, hey, do your best. We're taught in the world to strive to be number one. We're taught in the world to be competitive. We always want the biggest trophy, the most accolades, the greatest recognition. In fact, we even coined a little statement. It goes something like this. Second place is but the first loser. I mean, when somebody finishes second in the Daytona 500, I'm not even a NASCAR fan. But I didn't, don't too many people remember who won back in February. That's when they run it, right, Daytona? Uh, don't too many people remember who was second in that race. I mean, second place is just the first loser. And I agree with what we're taught in a certain degree. I mean, I think everybody, everybody, you know, ought to do their best. Man, we ought to, I mean, I don't play to lose, man. I play to win, praise God. Can I have a amen? In our day, we're dumbing this thing down. Everybody gets a trophy. Everybody's a winner. We no longer keep, so little league don't keep score much anymore. And, uh, you know, we want to level the playing field. We want everybody to walk off the field and feel good about themselves. At the end of the season, everybody gets a trophy, whether they showed up at practice or they didn't. They worked hard. Or they labored. They get a trophy just because we want everybody to feel good about themselves. My high leg on all that stuff. Yes, sir. I heard about this grandpa went to see his grandson play uh, baseball, and he got there a little bit late, so he asked his son. He said, son, what's the score? And some lady sitting up a bleach or two behind him said, hey, don't you understand? We don't keep score anymore. And if we did, it was zero to zero because everybody is a winner. His son looked back at her and said, yeah, that might be true, but if we did keep score, we're beating y'all 21 to 3. <laughs> hey, whatever happened to keeping score? I think we ought to be competitive. I'm not going to play to lose. Don't, if you lose, get mad about it. If you're playing tennis, a guy across the net beats you, don't run up to the net and shake his hand. Run up to the net and beat him to death with your tennis racket. I'm not playing to lose. Every time we played ball when I was growing up, if we lost, we fought about it most time with each other. You know, it's your fault we lost. It's your fault. You didn't do your best. You stunk it up. What's wrong with you? Listen, Jesus don't want to be second place in our life. Jesus wants to be first place in our life. Jesus Christ wants the first dime of every dollar. He wants the first dime of every dollar. I'm going to say it to y'all. Say Amen. He wants the first dime of every dollar. It's called tithing. He wants the first day of every week. Listen to me. He wants the first minutes of every day. He don't want to be second. He wants to be first. He don't want just a place. He don't want just prominence. Bless your heart. He wants to be preeminent. He wants to be number one. He ain't interested in being a resident in your life. He wants to be president in your life. He's not interested in being a zero. He wants to be the hero. And I'm telling you, it's about time some of God's people said, Jesus, I'm going to let you be number one in my life. But there's sometimes 
when second is better than first. And if you'll come back next week, I want to give you four things in the Bible that were second that are better than first. You say, what in the world are you talking about? Well, we won't be having Mexican food next Sunday night, but I'll finish this message next Sunday night. Let's bow our heads for prayer. Father.